been working really hard to come up with a visual that helps teachers understand um, and remember that as we move our students from beginners, where I always talk about kids having a basket of language that they can use, and so the beginners who have a very small basket with very few things in it, and as they get better, their basket gets bigger as they have more and more. So this is the latest best effort that we've found for a visual that shows how that pathway gets wider as you become more proficient in your language because you need, it's not just a, a single line. You have to have, be able to talk about more topics. That means you have to have more vocabulary. You have to be able to um, do more with a language. When you started out, maybe you were pointing to things and saying, oh, that's a chair, that's my teacher, that's my friend. Very short, memorized chunks of language. But then as you got better, hopefully, you started saying, that's my friend, and she is really very cool, because she's going to run in the marathon this weekend in Chicago with all those other crazy people that are downtown. And look at how much more language you had by that. So this latest image is trying to help you remember that as the kids get better, the arrow gets fatter, because they need to be able to say more and have more words. And that's why it takes longer amounts of time as you get better. I always think of my first year students when they came to class the first day and knew nothing and they left knowing at least how to say hello and how are you, etc. And they felt like they were really making great progress. And then they hit second year, second semester, third year, and they felt like, oh my gosh, I don't feel like I'm moving as fast. Well, that's because that arrow got wider, and they had to be able to do more things with it. It wasn't just that little short piece that felt like they were going um, in a stack. And so that might be something that you want to share with your students to help them have that mindset, too, that it's not just one line, but that we're filling in that arrow with lots of vocabulary and lots of ways to express your thoughts and ideas. So. There you have it, and that's what's really guiding the guidance document. So you have this beautiful document, and I see that you have copies to look at, and I've got page numbers up on the slides so that you can find the page that we're talking about, and maybe you want to make that document, which if you read the introduction, it talks about it being a living document. That means that as much as some of you might always like to keep your books very neat and tidy. Um, this is a book that the true test of whether it's working or not is how used it looks. Have you been circling, underlining, turning down page corners so you can find it, um, information easily? You have to beat up this document for it to really be useful. If it sits very polished, like you've never touched it, it's really not the purpose of that document at all. So. Um, on those first um, introductory pages, you've got a philosophy for uh, Chicago Public Schools, and I'd like you to take a minute to read it um, right here, and then turn and talk to those people that you just met, that you moved over to talk to, and see if you can um, give a definition to those three terms of education that fosters bilingualism, biliteracy, and intercultural flexibility. That's what you're doing. That's the philosophy of Chicago Public Schools, and that's what we tried to capture through the way um, the units were designed. When you think of bilingual, what comes to mind is the quick and easy definition? Speaking two languages, yeah. And, and you have kids like that in your classes. Um, we have them through the United States and more and more which has really given us pause to think about what we're doing in our language classes um, to help support their bilingual efforts. But then you get to biliteracy, and biliteracy is not just speaking two languages, but being able to read and write. And with, an, of course, 21st century changes all of our definitions a little bit because we're moving forward so much with technology 
the Council of Teachers of English in the United States said, you know, reading and writing isn't strong enough to describe literacy in the 21st century. It's really how kids are interacting with information, reading and writing, but with technology. So they've got lots more resources, and they've got lots more opportunity to share what they're thinking and creating with the entire world. And so that um, by literacy is really um, expanded what our original understanding of literacy was. And then the last one, intercultural flexibility. Right, right, so I was a French teacher and I can't tell you how many principals I had who said, why do these kids need to learn French? There aren't any French speakers in Appleton, Wisconsin, except teachers. So why do they really need to learn it? And you know, I had to think about it you know, as a young teacher to be able to respond to that, but also to help then my principal understand that every unit I did was helping kids understand how to communicate with someone else. Could be someone else in the same language who comes from a different background. Could be someone in a language other than French. But those tools that we're teaching the kids into how you understand, how you listen, how you look at someone to get clues to what they're seeing, what their passions are, what they're understanding, that's that all that intercultural flexibility. And so even if my students left my classroom and never ever bumped into anyone who spoke French. They left hopefully, always hopeful as a teacher, that they had some skills so when they met someone from another place, they could be a little more open, a little less judgmental, a little more oriented towards trying to understand that person's background and perspective. So those are the three and they're really good goals, fantastic goals for Chicago public schools to have. So that, that's your philosophy, and if you haven't um, thought about it lately, you might want to um, make a poster of that philosophy to have in your classroom so your students understand how important what they're doing is. Here's our agenda. We're going to go through the guiding principles that um, supported the development of your guidance document. Then we're going to look at unit design as we imagined it as being helpful to students for all those reasons that we just talked about. And finally, we're going to break it down into the template that you have in your document about how you can do a snapshot overview to a unit and be true to the guiding principles in this document. So those three pieces are our agenda for today. First, the guiding principles. Guiding principles, if you look at page 18, they talk about the world readiness standards. Okay? And the world readiness standards didn't get a new name just to be um, trendy. They got a new name because it, it really has become so important for our teachers and our learners to know that what they're learning in your classroom gets them ready for the world. Whether they're actually speaking your language or they're interacting with people from around the world. All of that is part of world readiness to go out and be a responsible global citizen. As you look at the image that's up here, it's an image that Laura Terrell and I worked on to try to help teachers keep one picture of what you have to think about as you design your units and lessons and as you think of the year and what you're gonna share with your students. So again, find someone to talk to and look at that and what stands out, how do you understand those um, three circles and I'm gonna give you the words that are in the middle of the circles because I see that they're a little hard to read. The rose pinkish colored circle says knowing myself. One of the teachers when I showed him this said, oh yeah, looking at the world with rose-colored glasses because the way I look at it is the right way. So that might help you remember the rose, knowing myself. The yellow one to the left is um, understanding, I think that yellow one is exploring communities and then um, engaging with the world is the third one. So 
and they overlap. So think about that as you talk. And in the center, there's that I. So look at that image. Think about what you teach, what you know about teaching, what you know about the standards, and share with each other what this image means to you. You've got the blue circle that is the center or focus of this graphic. And you may not be able to see very clearly, but there's actually a watermark of the world imprinted on that blue circle. So you've got that circle. What's surrounding the, the world? Yep, those, those five C's of our world readiness standards. Somebody said that they were hugging the world. So it's interesting to keep that in mind. Just inside of that globe, what are the three words that are printed on that? Yeah, our three kinds of communication interpretive, where we take information in, um, interpersonal, where we talk to each other, and presentational, where we do what I'm doing right now, presenting to you. And we need to work on all three. That's why we gave them equal weight inside the, the globe, that if we're going to be really strong communicators in that world, we have to be able to understand, we have to be able to present to other people, and we have to be able to interact with just like you are sitting here. Talk for a minute about that I. Uh, do some shout outs here. Uh, raise your hand and I'll, I'll point to you. What did the I mean to you? Interconnected, thank you. That's a great um, understanding. What else? Yes. I is me. And that's all about our kids, isn't it? They're right there in the middle of everything we do. And so that learner-centered classroom where you're always thinking about them and how are they going to respond, what are they going to be doing, that's another great understanding of I. What else? Yes. Identity. Yeah. How you understand someone else helps you understand yourself better. It's another great choice. What else? Sure, two of those modes start with I, interpretation, interpersonal. And when you think about it, that interpretation is where you're bringing in information and then interpersonal talking with someone about that information you gained, which is another I word, information. We live in an information age. Don't you feel sometimes like there's just way too much information for you to keep track of? You know, it's just like, whoa, information overload. I don't want another website to look at because I already have too many that are stacked in my bookmarks that I don't have time to go back to. Any other eyes? Individual. Individual. Very important. I'm just working on an article where we talk about the balance between the individual, who, which is so much a part of the kids we're teaching today. They want to do things on their um, timeline. They want to do things that are of interest to themselves. They want to do things um, in the way to show that they've learned that is interesting to them, not one that we assign them to do for demonstration. So that individual is something that we um, are constantly trying to um, honor for those students, but also knowing that part of that individual is being able to work with other people, and so balancing that. Any last eyes? Interrelated. Interrelated, absolutely everything that's in that image. We also talked about immersion, trying to use the target language as much as possible as a reminder. And then I have to tell you, this I has gotten so strong over time working with teachers. When Laura and I started with this image, we had one meaning for that I, and that was interculturality that it pulls it together, helping people understand each other better. But now we love all of the other eyes that teachers have added, and it's a, a great reminder of how complex our job is as classroom teachers. So the standards, guiding principles for your document, they are there everywhere. And that P 
page that you have with the world readiness standards, good for you to look back on, reread them. People thought, oh, they kept the five C's, I got it. I used to go to workshops on those. I don't need to know anything more about the new titled world readiness standards. But really, as you look at them, you're going to see lots of words that have strengthened those very simple standards that we started with in the 90s to ask kids not only to interact but to analyze, to reflect. You're going to see that word reflect. Think about what you're learning. Think about what you're doing. Think about how you're communicating. There you'll see lots of um, references to that. And then that cultural piece, always being aware that that communication takes place in a cultural context and helping students understand not just the words, but the cultural message that comes with those words. So page three, and then on, again on page seven, another guiding principle. After you've got those standards as your foundation, as your platform, the next thing that we thought about when we were working on this document was that pathway. How do kids get better at language? And so proficiency is another guiding principle. And you'll see information about that on pages three and seven. And again, look at the sentence that I pulled out um, from those pages. Competence, skillfulness in the command of fundamentals deriving from meaningful practice and familiarity. Meaningful practice greatly improves proficiency. So maybe you want to turn another direction and talk to someone new. How would you define, give examples of what meaningful practice looks like in your classroom? What does it look like? Now, this is the hard part. I want you to all stand up. Oh, really, do we have to? Yes, stand up. Stand up. That was great. We've got a great model up here in front, stretching a little bit so you can keep focused. Okay, I want you to turn and talk to someone that you haven't talked to and share what you talked about in terms of meaningful practice. You can walk around a little bit, find someone new. What was meaningful practice? What did you hear? hear? What did you share? Standing up here that the noise got a little higher when you got up and were able to move around a little bit. Something that I would forget in my effort to get as much done during a class period as I could. I forget to have the kids stand up and move a little bit and how helpful that is to refocus, to wake up a little bit, to stretch. Um, really good idea partway through the class period to do something where they have to get up and move around a little bit, talk to somebody different. It's so easy to just turn and talk to your partner, but it is important for them to get up and move a little bit um, so that their um, blood gets circulating again in their brains as they go. Meaningful practice, I think, when I, I think of the guidance document, those sample units that are at the end are the teacher's efforts to design learning that would be meaningful for the students. Not working first on the grammar and then finding a place to put the grammar into a conversation, but saying, let's talk about something that's interesting, um, important, um, meaningful to you. And when we're talking about it, we're going to use the language that we're learning to share our ideas. And so the grammar comes afterwards and not first. So keep that in mind, that it really changes the order that we present information to our students. And keeping that, those grammar pieces that are still important, they have to work on accuracy, on understanding how the language comes together. But in little chunks, not a whole presentation on everything you ever wanted to know about future tense and some things you didn't ever want to know. I remember having students who would say to me, all I asked was how to say, I'll be happy, 
and you gave me a whole unit on irregular future tense, the, how to find the stem, how to put the endings on it for all the different people, and all I really wanted to know was, I will be happy. Um, I overkill to the max because I love grammar so much. I was sure they would too if I shared it with them. Meaningful practice. I should have stopped after I told the student, je serai heureuse, I'll be happy. They would have smiled and gone back to their desks and used it the way they wanted to. Um, but I did my grammar lesson. Such a good person. OK, and another view of that proficiency is always keeping in mind the difference between what happens in the real world, proficiency, and what, that's what our goal is, is so that when kids leave your classroom and they do try to use their language, that they can be successful. Even if they don't have to tell people, um, I'm going to talk to you using chapter 6 vocabulary. Okay? We really don't want them to be pigeonholed into that kind of orientation. We want them to be able to say, I want to talk to you about what I like to do. And I can use all the words that I've learned in order to do that. It's proficiency, and I have confidence and courage to be able to do that and not say I can only talk to you if we're on chapter six. Performance is where that chapter comes in, what we work on with the learners. So you've got two columns that compare, and they're side by side. So the first bullet point under proficiency matches up with the first one under performance. So take a minute, read through those, read across, and see if the comparison makes sense. Proficiency, what we hope the kids can do when they leave the classroom, and they're not tied to a special unit. And then what we do in the classroom performance to get them to be really strong communicators on a topic that we're working on together. Okay, that difference between performance and proficiency is really important for you to keep in mind. In fact, this slide, you might want to make a copy of it to remind yourself of where you're headed with the kids so that when they leave the classroom, they really have some courage and confidence to be able to talk to someone and not have to hold up a card and say, I can only do chapter six. Okay, so we have to give them opportunities to practice a little bit outside the box, but, but the way that they get strong is by practicing within the box of a unit. Okay? And when we think about those units, like the ones that are in your guidance doc document, those give you good examples of language and action. Okay? On a topic that we hope is interesting to the students, the teachers all designed them with the idea of, I think my students would like learning about this. I think they would find things to talk about. I think it would be helpful for them. And so we work on those units. We're going to break it down into the, how the unit is, is constructed. But it's through those units and practicing them that they get to be really strong. And after they do more and more and more units, remember how that arrow fills in and it's wider and wider, they stand a better chance of being at a higher level of proficiency because they have more things they can say. And they have more things that they can say well because they've practiced them. Okay? It's a really important distinction for us to keep in mind that because we work really hard to allow our students to be very successful unit by unit, as we put all those units together, they're going to be better off when they go out and try to communicate because they've got good, solid patterns in their head. They've got good, solid language in their head. They've got things they can talk about. And that's where we're headed when we think about that guiding principle we're keeping in mind, in the back of our mind, will my kids be successful when they leave my classroom and I'm not telling them we're just working on this topic? Okay. And hopefully the answer will be yes, because they've got solid models 
on a variety of topics to work with. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure, it's like, you know, and, and we certainly all know about standardized tests, okay? And what has happened in the United States, unfortunately, with those standardized tests is that somebody thought it was really good to tell you to teach directly to the test as um, content, the exact, you know, if you could teach the exact questions, somebody would say that's a really good idea. What we're saying is we want kids, the test is if they can communicate when they go out in the world. And if we give them lots of really good models of meaningful practice on a topic, then when they're not in our classroom on a certain unit, we think they're going to do really well because they have so much solid information to draw from. That was the theory of standardized tests in the old way of thinking about it, when we didn't have to test every year, every way, three times a year. You know, in Finland, they give two tests in the lifetime of a student. That's stepping back and saying, how prepared are they at the end of elementary and at the end of high school? It would be wonderful if we could adopt some of that mindset so we didn't have to spend so much time testing. And so what we do as language teachers is give kids rich, meaningful experiences, knowing that if it's rich and meaningful, they're going to remember it, parts of it, a lot of it, most of it. And then when they're out in the world using their language, they've got that knowledge ready to go. That's what we're thinking is, is so critical in understanding the difference between performance, what we do in the classroom, and getting them ready for proficiency when they're out in the world. It'll become, I think, a little clearer as we go through the document and look at the example units. So, guiding principle. Hmm, go through your mind. We talked about the standards. We talked about proficiency. Now we're going to talk about time. It takes time. And Americans are not known for being patient, especially not our students. They, they want it right now. So look at this chart, and you'll see on page 9 and then 10 through 12, we've actually taken this chart and uh, applied it to the different models that you have in Chicago Public Schools. So you might want to look through pages 10 through 12 and find you the model you're teaching in and see what the best um, understanding is as to how far kids are going to get on that proficiency continuum. If somebody came in, would they say you're a beginner, you're an intermediate, or you're advanced? So take a minute and look at that. And you might want to compare them to some of the other models that you know are around you to see the difference. Again, I'm going to call you back together. You had a chance to find your program to see what's realistic but challenging. It's not dummying down at all. It's acknowledging that four-letter word, time, and remembering that how that arrow gets fatter and fatter because you have to be able to talk about more and more things. It's not one topic, move up a level. One topic, move up a level. It's having that breadth of experience that makes you a strong communicator. So our proficiency experts tell us, hurry slowly. Hurry slowly. In other words, give the kids lots of activity to practice the language, keep that pace moving in the classroom so they don't nod off. But remember that they need lots of practice in different ways, doing the same kinds of um, tasks to get better at them. Describing, 
You know, when the, the can-do, if you're familiar with the can-do statements, when they first came out, people started checking them off. And when I started working with them, when they first came over from Europe, I didn't understand that document 100%. And so I gave the kids that list of can-dos, and they were working on talking about their family. And it said, and so they wrote, I can describe my family, check. And then they said, I think now I'm intermediate. And I said, mm, I don't think so. And that's because they could describe their family, and if they were beginners, they could describe them in very simple terms. But then they also needed to know that even as a beginner, that arrow gets fatter and fatter. They not only have to be able to describe their family, but they have to be able to describe their friends. They have to be able to describe their house. They have to be able to describe what their um, city looks like. They need lots of examples of describing. That's the hardest thing to get kids to understand that they need lots of practice on different topics to get better and quicker at being able to describe. And you will always have those kids who look at you and say, okay, I get it, not just one, but how many, madame? How many do I really need to be able to describe before I can move? And that's the million dollar question. It's when it becomes natural for them. You feel like I could give them a new situation. Oh, I want you to be able to describe um, what you saw in a movie you went to. And, and they just start saying what they can do. It might be simple because they can describe who the people were and what they were doing. But they just start out and they can do it easily without having to say, okay, now I have to look at my list of adjectives. Now I have to remember how I say he is, etc. That it just flows. And when you start seeing that from your students, even when you give them a new topic, then you say, you know, you're getting to be a really strong beginner. I think we're ready to move forward. That's a hard understanding for teachers, for parents, for administrators, for kids, to know that it's that comfort that they don't have to start sweating when you say we need to describe something else now, that they can do it. That's just one small example, but that's that time factor and that um, enjoying the journey and taking time instead of thinking that you're going to just zoom from Chicago to Los Angeles and never stop along the way, taking time to stop along the way to enjoy the places that ultimately get you to Los Angeles or strong proficiency. So, guiding principle. Every time we think of what we're going to teach for the students, we think of the three modes, okay? That they have to not just read a story, and that's my unit. It's not put on a skit, and that's my unit. It's not um, have a conversation with someone, and we're going to record it, and that's my unit. It's putting those three pieces together, and that's what makes you a strong communicator. You need all three. And those modes of communication are explained on pages three through six in your um, handout. And so what I'm going to do, and, and then we're going to talk about the benchmarks on page 20. So you might want to glance at pages three through six and then look at that chart on page 20 that gives you a real snapshot of how kids um, look at each of the levels in each of the different modes. Okay. okay, that next slide is about how Common Core reflects our three modes of communication. And so you've got a wordle up here with all the, the words that the English language arts people think about when they're talking about Common Core. All those words apply to what we're doing too. There's a crosswalk that um, starts on page 24 in your guidance document that shows you the um, how the Common Core lines up with the modes of communication. And if you're collaborating with your English language arts teachers, that would be a good document to 
share with them and see if you can reinforce each other with the way you think about that listening, uh, reading, writing, speaking, and uh, accuracy of developing um, proficient speakers. It's also a great document to share with your administrators if they're not sure that you're critically important to the development of the kids um, in their school. You can show them page 24, Common Core, we match up, we do the same thing through another language. So um, it's good to share that and let people know how um, we are all working together for the same big goals of improved learning for all children in our programs.